How you guys doing? I am uh, back from the dead. Uh, just want to say thank you to all of you who shared your stories last week when I was home puking my guts out. Um, I was uh, I was really sad to miss our ninth birthday celebration, but from what I heard as people were texting me during the service and after the service, uh, it went well. So thank you for those of you uh, who shared your story of how Oasis has impacted your life as God has worked through our church and each other um, to do what the church is built to do, to be a community. And uh, so it was very good, very good to hear those reports. Um, and, uh, and thanks to Andrea, who kind of led that thing. And I called her Saturday night at like 8.30, and she was on a date with Kyle in Portland. And I was like, hey, bad news. Like, <laughs> I, we got to have a backup plan. And she's like, are you kidding me? And I said, no, unfortunately, I'm not. So um, Andrea, as you listen to the podcast, thank you very much. Um, two things this morning um, that we have on the docket that I want to share with you. One um, we're going to start a brand new series that's going to carry us for the next seven weeks into uh, Easter. And uh, we're going to be walking through the Gospel of John, which I'm very excited about. It's a phenomenal Gospel. Uh, I'm excited to, to share that with you over the next two months. Um, but before we get to that, I want to give you an update on our building search uh, and where we are in that. Most of you know that Oasis uh, was started at West Salem High School nine years ago. And uh, Pastor Keith and Michelle kind of got this group of people together, and their, their heart and their desire and their passion was to reach the families of West Salem so that no one had to have that conversation with their children, that mom and dad aren't going to be together again. And, and God birthed this, this church um, out of 40 people. And, uh, and, and there was this trailer, and every week Elliot would pull this thing up to West Salem High School, and a group of people would go to work hours before people would show up, and they would be moving tables, and they would be unloading things, and they'd be connecting sound cables and setting up speakers and building a stage and a backdrop and all of this stuff, and the, the nursery and the preschool and the grade school would all be pulled out of this trailer where everything that this church owned lived. And they would set all of this up, believing that God would bring people to hear the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and it happened. Week after week, people would come and hear about Jesus. And then that, that team, that crew, would then tear everything back down and load it back into this trailer. And that trailer would then go and sit and wait until next week, when it all would happen again and again and again for five years I was not a part of this, um, which is why I don't have as much gray hair right now. Um, but, but from what I've heard from those of you who were there during those days, these were both incredible days and, and challenging days. They were difficult. They were tiring. Um, but there was this common goal and common purpose to preach the gospel, to reach this community so that behind every single front door, the kingdom of God could be established. And so for five years at West Salem High School, Oasis did this week after week after week after week. And after five years of doing this, the church decided that it was time to make a move. It, it, was, it was time to change and do something different. And the decision was made to move from the hills of West Salem at West Salem High School and move downtown into the heart of Salem. And we're here at the Grand. And, uh, and that was a big move from what, I, what I'm told in those days. It, it was a change of identity from who Oasis was and what they were doing and this, this call that they had to those families uh, up in West Salem to come downtown and, and, and tweak their identity. And it, it was a challenge. But God, through what only God can do, continued to bless this church. And, and new faces began to appear and new ministry opportunities. And God continued to work as, as this church followed the leading and direction that God had for it. And, uh, and so we have, after four years of being here at the Grand, got to the point where we again get to find where God is calling us next. What is this next place going to look like? Where is it going to be? And so for the last year and a half, Pastor Keith and the church board and our realtor and I have been searching, 
diligently <laughs> all over the place looking at every single possible location that we could go to. Our, our desire was to find a building that would be our permanent home, to, to purchase a place that we could put our stamp on and then we could put roots down in a specific location and begin to build a ministry that would last for decades. And so we, we raised money and we have been looking and we have been looking and we've been looking. Um, some of you know that, uh, that I've been spending a large chunk of my week over the last six months looking for this building. And, and trying to figure out where God had us. And, I, and I've looked at every building that has been on the market and a lot of buildings that have not been on the market in a very, very large radius. Um, not quite to Brooks uh, and not quite to Turner and Almsville, but pretty much everywhere in between. And uh, we've been in some negotiations with different buildings um, that for a myriad of reasons God has closed the door on. And, uh, and I've been frustrated by that. I've been challenged by that, um, but constantly I come back to the reality that God is for us, and God has something for us, and I don't know what that is yet. Um, we are still looking for that building. I-, I wish that I was standing here today saying, congratulations, we have an option for us to purchase, and we know where our next location is, but that's not the case. Um, we are still in that wandering in the wilderness period that the Israelites spent 40 years in waiting for God to do something. I am absolutely convinced that it won't be 40 years. Okay? <laughs> but at this point, we, we don't have that location. So, so in the last couple of weeks, as the church board and I have tried to think creatively and brainstorm and come up with what, what should we do? What is the wise decision and wise direction? Where is God leading us right now? We, we begin to think creatively. If we can't find a building that we can purchase and we can't find a building that we can do some sort of long-term 10-year lease that we can actually have 24-7, what are we going to do in the meantime? as we continue to look for that location that we believe God is preparing for us, what do we do? Um, we, we have six weeks left, in, including this week here at the Grand. And we, we've loved the Grand. It's been fantastic. I actually have an office, which is cool. Um, but, but this is not our permanent home. And so what do we do in the meantime while we continue to look for this home? So the church board, I, I, I sent them an email this week, and I said, what about this? What, what if we open up our possibilities and, um, and we begin to look at partnering with churches? And, and not just churches like Seventh-day Adventist churches that worship on Saturdays and therefore usually their buildings are open on Sundays and not just Jewish uh, synagogues that do the same. They worship on Saturdays and so sometimes their buildings are open on Sundays, which apparently a lot of them are not, as I've been finding out. What if we moved not location what if we didn't cross the river like Oasis did last time, but what if we moved our time? What, what if instead of going somewhere and having that be the big challenge that God has for us this time, what, what if that means we move to a Sunday evening service or a late Sunday afternoon service? And I, and I pitched this to the church board and I said, I, I've been a part of a church plant. I planted a church years ago that did this and I, I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. We were able to do a lot of things that we couldn't do in my previous ministry uh, at a larger church that we could do on Sunday evenings. We, we, uh, we could actually sleep in on Sundays, which was kind of nice. Uh, we were able to go away for the weekend and not just have it be a Saturday day, but actually a Saturday night, and then you come back on Sunday and imagine having an actual weekend. It was actually fantastic. We had a lot of phenomenal things, but the most important thing that happened when we were at Valley River Church and we met Sunday evenings is we had people that were working Sundays during the day and they couldn't worship anywhere else. And so they showed up at Valley River because they were looking for a community that they could actually worship with. And and you might not know this, but we have several people that join our community groups during the week that can't worship with us on Sunday morning. And they want to be a part of our community, but they just can't because they have to work. And so I said to the church board, is this something that you would be willing to think about? At least an option, short term, while we continue to look for that building. 
could, could we actually do this? And the church board has uh, been very excited about this. Yet maybe this is the new crossing of the river that we had. And, and it's not something that would be permanent. It's something that might be short term. But, but I don't know. I know that God needs us to do something while God continues to work and we continue to pray and continue to, to, to look for this place. And so here's what I'm asking you. Here's the building update. We don't have a solid place that I can present to you today. But we do have a possibility. I went and looked at a building on Thursday that, if we needed it, would be open to us for a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening service. We could, we could go there. I've talked to the facilities manager. I've looked around. And it would serve us as a location. It would be temporary as we continue to look. But what I need from you is I need you this week to think and pray about this. As you spend time in your devotions, as you spend time with God and you're praying this week, please make it a priority. Talk to God and ask God for wisdom and direction. Is this something that our church needs to do? Because here's what I'm going to do. Next week, we're going to take an unofficial, non-binding straw poll. And, and I want your feedback. I've heard feedback from the, the church board. I've, I've talked to a couple of people in the congregation and just said, what, what could this look like? Is this something you would be willing to do? You and your family, would you be willing to do this? And everybody that I've talked to so far has said, yeah, you know, that actually doesn't sound too bad. Uh, uh, I can imagine having weekends to go somewhere and do something, to sleep in, to not have to rush the kids out in the morning and, you know, stuff your scrambled eggs in your pocket and just get in the van. Um, <clears throat> this is a possibility. And, and, um, and what I want from you is I want you to talk to your community group. I want you to talk to your spouse. I want you to think about this and pray about this week. And next week we're going to come back and we're going to have a non-binding, non-official, just straw poll. Is this something you'd be willing to do short term? while we continue to look and wait for God to provide us with something. I, I like the idea. I've done it before. I really enjoyed it. But I want to know from you, as a church family, is this something you would be willing to do as we continue to wait for God to move? Or is it not? Should, should we continue to hold out and wait and see what God has for us? I don't know. But I know that we're going to continue to look and we're going to continue to pray. And I will probably continue to lose some sleep over this. <sighs> But my desire is to follow the Lord. And, and I know through experience that God often speaks through God's people. And that it's not just scripture where God is contained, but it is actually through us and the move of the Holy Spirit. And your words and your wisdom and your seeking of God as well, on our behalf as a church, I need to hear you hear from the Lord. So next week, we're going to do that. We're going to take a, a, a straw poll, and uh, you know maybe you can just fold it up in an airplane and, and throw it at me during the service. Um, but I want to know what God says to you. So that, that is our building update. I don't have one for you. I have a possibility. And, and doing this and opening it up to Sunday evenings could open up a plethora of new options with other churches in town. But I want to hear from you, because I want to hear from the Lord. So that's where we're at. That's, that's docket number one, which is... The building update. Docket number two is our new sermon series. And, and that is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is phenomenal. Uh, and so if you would please open to the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, paper Bible or Bible app or wherever you find yourself reading scripture at these days. This is going to be a seven-week series and we are going to finish this series Easter Sunday, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ at our new location, wherever that may be. So um, as you find the Gospel of John, uh, I want to spend a little bit and give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history on this book, um, kind of why it was written, who it was written by, the community that was happening and everything that was going on while John was writing this Gospel. So the Gospel of John, most scholars agree, is written by the Apostle John, known as the disciple that Jesus loved. Um, he was uh, the other half of the brothers, the, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, uh, who were known to be a little hot-headed, uh, easily um, intense, not that we have anybody around here like that, right? 
John not only wrote this gospel, but he also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, and the book of Revelation. If you've ever tried to read the book of Revelation, Jesus be with you. It is one heck of a ride. But this is John, and this, these are the books that he wrote. This is what he penned. John was, um, was quite an interesting guy. And, and this gospel that we're about to read and spend almost two months in is not like the other three gospels. The other three gospels, known as the synoptic gospels, give a synopsis of Jesus' life in more of a chronological, biographical way. They, they tell the story of Jesus. And, and they're very, very similar, these, these three gospels. But John is different. John is written for a very different purpose. It's not as straightforward. It's not as linear. And John tells us exactly why he wrote the gospel this way. He, he tells us at the end of this gospel, he, his entire purpose is to answer one question. All, all of these chapters are to answer the most important question that will ever be asked by any of us and must be asked by every single person on the entire face of the earth. And that question is this, who is Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? And as we spend the next seven weeks walking through this gospel together, I want you to hear over and over and over as John asks this question of his readers, who is Jesus? And then he definitively answers it every single step of the way. This is how he ends his account of Jesus. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in him. Everything that we're going to read over the next seven weeks boils down to this right here. Jesus Christ, Son of God, in whom you have life. Every, everything that he writes, every eyewitness, eyewitness account, every miracle, every time Jesus is on that page, it is to answer this question. Who is this man? Who is Jesus? And his answer resounds consistently and constantly. Jesus is God in the flesh. So we know the purpose of this book that John wrote. What else do we know about this book? This book is, uh, is very fascinating. It's actually the oldest fragment, the oldest remnant of any of the New Testament, any at all that's ever been found that we know is an existent on this planet is actually from John's Gospel. It's been dated back to about 125 or so, which is about 30 years after John wrote this. So it's a copy of a, of a copy, maybe, maybe two out, maybe three. But it is, it, historically speaking, mind-blowing that we have something that close in date to when it was written to what we actually have. You, you don't see that anywhere else for something 2,000 years old. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It act, it's actually held in this really beautiful display, this glass display um, at the University of Manchester in their library. It is an incredibly valuable relic. So who, who is John? Who, who's this guy that wrote this gospel? Well, he's, he's the youngest of the 12 disciples. And so that, that should tell you something right there. How many of you have children? Your youngest is always unique. Your youngest always has very unique characteristics. Um, but there's always a very special bond with the youngest, isn't there? There's a very special connection. And, and that's one of the things that sets John apart as one of the disciples. Is, is he is known as the, the one whom Jesus loved. He, he's one of, the, one of the inner circle, one of the three. James and John, the, the brothers, and, and Peter as well. And they, they were constantly invited to go beyond where the other disciples weren't, to, to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and to see this incredible, miraculous moment where, um, where Jesus is transfigured. And, um, and, and it changes him. And, and when Jesus is, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested and then executed, 
it, it's John and James and Peter who are, who are asked to go further into the garden with Jesus as he prayed. He, he has a very intimate relationship with Jesus that you, you will see sprinkled through this gospel. He, uh, you can watch him in his writings as he writes, as he, as he matures, as he gets older, as he begins to ponder back through what he's experienced and what he witnessed, the miracles and, and the teachings and the way that Jesus interacted with people. You can see as, as he uses the maturity of age and the wisdom that comes with years and years to look back on those and to realize what was truly going on. John was the only uh, disciple that was not martyred for his faith. For, for whatever reason, he was the only one of the 12 that lived and died of natural causes when he was in his 90s. He was a, he was a prominent figure in the, in the early church. And, and because he lived so long, he, he saw the early church as it began to flourish and gospel spread and all of these amazing things happen. And then he saw the crackdown of Rome and the persecution. And he heard the rumors and the tales of the sacking of Jerusalem as Romans came in and, and slaughtered town after town after town. And he heard the stories of his fellow disciples as he would get reports of them being martyred for Jesus wondering why he was left, and he didn't have to go through the same thing. He was, he was the last one to write in the New Testament. He, he was the one who carried that burden of being the last person who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus. And as he ministered in, in Ephesus, and um, the people would surround him and, and, and beg him to tell them one more time, what was he actually like? What was it like to sit at his feet and to listen and to hear God in the flesh speak? To see the power of the resurrection. You were there, John, what was that like? Tell us one more time. And it's said in his lighter days that he was, um, that he was so old that they would carry him out and they would put him on, they would put him on pillows and, and they would beg him John, you've got to write down your story. The other, the other disciples wrote gospels, and you need to write this down. You can only tell it for so long. You're not going to live forever, John. And so he did. He, he wrote his gospel, and he wrote the letters, and, and he, was finally, um, he was finally captured by the Romans and, and exiled to the island of Patmos where um, he was given the, the revelation and, and wrote that down for us. And he, he finally died of, of natural causes in his 90s. And as the last living apostle, he, he took the job very seriously of being the one, not only who was the last to live and to have known Jesus, but the last to write his story and his account of who Jesus was. To answer this, this, this question, who is Jesus? And that's how he starts this gospel. By telling us exactly who Jesus is in this, this interesting, beautiful, complex, confusing poetry. He says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not over. John takes one of the most well-known passages from Jewish scripture, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he marries this idea that Jesus not only was there, but Jesus is God. Jesus was the one doing the creating. Jesus is the representation. He is the word. He is the, the manifest will of God. And that everything, the entire cosmos, every star, every galaxy, 
every plant and microbe, everything that has been created was done through Jesus. This, this creative power and will and desire of God, the lagos, the word, that's Jesus. And so when you read through Scripture, what you are reading is God and Jesus. They are one in this complex, Trinitarian, impossible for us to understand relationship. This entire chapter is, uh, is incredibly full of theological gold. When, when I was praying this morning with, uh, with the prayer team upstairs, uh, Jason Darowich was like, hey, what are you going to preach on this morning? And I was like, hey, you know, we're going to start the, the Gospel of John. And he was like, oh, oh my gosh. I'm like, how do you even do that? Like, it is so complex and good luck. And I said, thank you. My, my hope is that uh, God is able to speak despite me and through me. And so John continues to write, after writing and, and trying to put into words that which is inconceivable and unfathomable, this relationship between God and Jesus and all that that entails. He goes on into verse 12, and he lays out this, this mind-blowing idea at the very, very beginning that is the heart of what he will write about for the next 21 chapters, where he says that if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, if you receive Jesus, you are given the right to become a child of God. That Jesus is that linchpin. That is who Jesus is. Not only is he God, not only is he the creator and the word of God, but he is the linchpin for your life and your salvation with God. He then goes on in verse 14, and entire ministries that have impacted the world have been built around this verse right here. First chapter, 14th verse. And the word became flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. Who is Jesus? That's that's Jesus. Jesus is God become flesh. As my youth pastor in high school said, God with a bod. Good old 90s. God, God is this manifest being that comes down as a person, as a human, and dwells among us, that comes down into our mess and our sin and our failure, and this world that we have created for ourselves that is so screwed up. And the creator of the cosmos, out of his deep desire and love for us, puts himself into a body and shows up on earth, full of grace and truth. so that we could finally comprehend the incomprehensible, so that we could see a physical representation of the reality of who God is, God's characteristics, what God is all about. It is through Jesus. As you read through this gospel, you will see over and over and over the physical representation of God. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And as God takes this physical form, we are finally able to grasp that which is unfathomable. 
Because God came not only so that we could know God fully, but to rebuild that relationship bridge that we torched a long time ago. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory full of grace and truth. That's where we get our core value. We are a community of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Salt and light. So what John does after this beautiful poetic introduction uh, of the impossible to explain and yet beautifully written, he, he begins to take a look at the calling of the first disciples and, and Jesus' interaction with John the Baptist. How, however, John, unlike the Synoptic Gospels, he doesn't go moment by moment and play by play. He doesn't just give a timeline and, and here are all the facts and this is a biography. What he does is he takes all of the events and all of the things that he was eyewitness to and he begins to intertwine them and, and, and shape them in a way, yet again, to answer the question, who is Jesus? And so as we read through the rest of this, of this chapter, we see Jesus interacting with person after person after person. And, and John uses his memories and his recollections of what happened to show us through the eyes of the people that were interacting with Jesus who he is. And he gives him names and he gives him titles. Seven, actually, which we'll, we'll get more into the use of John and seven and his love of that and whatever that was all about uh, in the coming weeks. But, but he, he uses the next couple of verses to give Jesus seven names and titles. Lamb of God, Son of God, Rabbi, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, King of Israel, and Son of Man. Now, if you were a Jew in the first and second century, you would hear these titles and these names given to this single person, and your gears would begin to go. And you would begin to think, and you would begin to think, oh, wait a minute, okay, hold on. You would start putting things together that we don't get quite as much. And he uses the next half of this book to explain these seven names and these seven titles, the miracles that would be happening, all of the interactions that Jesus had, the way that he talked to people, the things that he claimed, all of the revelation that he would be giving to the people, and he begins to back up all seven of these titles over the next half of this book. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to go in and we're going to see how John does this because he has a very specific and very um, creative way of explaining to us over and over and over just who Jesus is. And why it is that John began to respect and love and ultimately give his entire life to this man who he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt to be God in the flesh who came to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. The band's going to come up this morning and we are, um, we're going to close out this service. And, and we have a lot to get to, and there's so much in this book. And, and I'm excited to walk through this with you over the next couple of weeks. But my question for you is this. Do, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Not, not just do you know about Jesus. Can, can you tell a couple of stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and the, the raising of Lazarus, and, uh, Lazarus and, and, and do you know the resurrection story? Not do you know about, but do you know personally? The way that John knew personally Jesus. Because that is Jesus' desire for us, for, for me, as, as we prepare ourselves spiritually for Easter to know on a personal, passionate level Jesus. 
And so there's two things that I ask you this week. One, one, as you spend time with God, pray about this possibility of, of going to an afternoon or evening service. Let, let me know what you think next week. Talk about it with your community group, with your spouse, um, with your cat, whatever you need to do. Um, but, but let me know. Take, take this seriously. I, I don't know if this is the next uh, river crossing moment for Oasis. I have no idea. But I want to I hear what God is speaking to you on that. But most importantly, read this book. Read this account of John about Jesus. Read through the miracles and the eyewitness accounts and watch as Jesus interacts with people. Listen to the way that he talks to people. Be amazed once again at the miracles. See through John's eyes as he witnesses the resurrection of Jesus. My prayer for us, Oasis, is that we would not just know about Jesus, but that we would know Jesus on an intimate level in the same way that John did, so that as we approach our old age, the next generation would come to us and say, tell me once again, about Jesus. Tell me about this man that you know and that you love, that you've seen work in your life and in the lives of others. Tell me about Jesus. One more time. Not because you know about Jesus, but because you know Jesus. That's my prayer for us.